On the record today, my guest is Professor Martin Kuldorf, who is from the Harvard Medical School. And why Professor Kuldorf has hit the headlines across the world is because he's part of a group of three authors, very well-known epidemiologists and public health experts, who have advocated for everything opening up and of herd immunity. They are for herd immunity. They're saying that the cost of keeping things closed is much higher than the safety that lockdown brings. So to talk about his ideas, I have uh, Professor Martin Kuldorf here with me. Thanks so much for joining us from uh, Boston this morning. Uh, uh, thank you for speaking to Hindustan Times. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. So I want to start from the beginning, this document and this, you know, this theory that you and Professor Sunetra Gupta and other experts have is just to get our viewers and those who are listening in to understand, it's called the Great Barrington Declaration. So tell us how it came about. So uh, uh, the key thing with COVID-19 is that while anybody can be infected, there's enormous difference in risk or mortality between the ages. And it's not just twofold or tenfold, not even hundredfold. There's more than a thousandfold difference in risk between the old and the young. So we're not advocating for opening up everything and just doing nothing, because uh, that's not a good idea, because if you do that, a lot of the old will be infected and there'll be mortality. Uh, but the young are not at risk here. So the key thing is we need to do a better job protecting the old among us and other high-risk groups. While there's no reason to close schools or universities, for example, so uh, children should be able to go to school for in-person teaching and young adults should live their lives normally. And by locking down the way it's been done in the US and many other countries has created a lot of collateral damage. Uh, and that collateral damage uh, is primarily uh, hitting uh, the working class and the poor. So what we're doing now, we're protecting low-risk college students and low-risk professionals, like uh, journalists like you, or scientists like me, or bankers, or insurance agents, and so on, uh, who are at very low risk because they are in the 20s, 30s, or 40s. At the same time, uh, Older working age people like bus drivers or uh, janitors, they are exposed because they have to work. And of course, many in the working class is also losing their work jobs and uh, uh, have in some cases hard time feeding their families. So that's enormously tragic uh, on a worldwide scale. So instead of this general lockdown of closing down uh, across the board, we should focus our attention on protecting the elderly and other high-risk groups while letting young people live lives normally until uh, there's herd immunity, in which case the older people can also live normal lives. I have lots of questions about that, especially in the Indian context as well, because I don't know if you know, but in India, we went into lockdown very quickly uh, people were only given four hours before everything was shut down. So a lot of people were stranded and that became a major news headline. And of course, the people who got stranded were migrant workers. And they're the ones, of course, the vulnerable that you are talking about, that you're saying they should be allowed to go back to work and things should open up. Of course, right now in India, things have opened up. What hasn't opened up, which you are advocating for, is schools. Schools is something that everyone is uh -huh. very, very... Uh, kind of scared about because isn't it true? And what you say of that, uh, Professor Kuldorf, is that people feel that while children are vulnerable of less vulnerable from of contracting the coronavirus, but they could be carriers. You don't believe. Uh, so obviously, a natural reaction of everybody, and I'm a parent, is we have to protect the children and we want to make sure they are safe. But the key feature of of COVID is that. For children, this is less dangerous than the annual flu uh, in uh, North America and Europe. I don't know exactly what how the annual flu affects India, uh, but uh, it's much less dangerous than the annual flu in both Europe and, uh, and the US. And if you want to examine the effect of opening schools during a pandemic, we should look at 
the one Western European uh, Western country who actually kept schools open during the height of the pandemic, which is Sweden. So while, while there were a lot of transmission in Sweden, this, the child care and schools in Sweden were open from ages 1 to 15. And there are 1.8 million children in Sweden who therefore were in school. And among these 1.8 million children, there were exactly zero deaths of COVID-19 during this time period. Uh, there were a handful of hospitalizations. So uh, there are very few children who do get a disease, but uh, again, less than for many other things, less than the flu, got less risk than the traffic accident. Also, if we look at teachers, because maybe they will infect the teachers. Well, the risk of teachers in Sweden was the, uh, the same as the average of other professions. And since some of the other professions were actually working from home, if you compare it only to those other professions who actually went to work, it's actually less for, for teachers than for the other ones. So the teachers are not at high risk either, which means that children are not major transmitters of this disease. So they're not posing a risk to the teachers. The teachers are actually more at risk from each other than from the children. So in the schools, it would be, make sense that the teachers don't hang out too much with each other, but that they, but the children are fine. And of course, all the teachers are at high risk. So if you're a 63-year-old teacher, then you're at high risk. So it would be good if schools could be creative and have them maybe teach from home or help other teachers with grading homeworks or essays or exams. Uh, but there's no public health reason whatsoever to keep the schools closed uh, during the pandemic. But that, I know you're saying that, you know, the case study that we have is from Sweden, but would that situation be totally different in a place like India where uh, a lot of children stay in joint families where there are elderly at home? So would you say that it's, it's good that India hasn't opened up its schools? And also the other thing about schools I wanted to ask you was that the suggestion is that Sweden never had those kind of numbers. So with India, where we are reporting about 63,000 cases, new cases every day, would this be the right time? Would you still say, despite that, the schools should open up? Uh, yes, they should. And um, there's two reasons. One is Closing the schools have enormous collateral damage. It's very bad for children. And it's not just the education, it's also their physical health and their mental health. Uh, the children have suffered a lot from not being able to go to school. Uh, and it's especially the working age, uh, working class children who suffer because those of us who are more privileged, we can hire a tutor or put them in private schools or post schooling is popular in the US. So it's primarily the working class children that are affected by the closing schools. Now, if we compare with Sweden, there are, of course, differences. Uh, but for a while, Sweden actually had the highest uh, mortality rate from COVID in the world for, for, for a few weeks in April. So certainly Sweden was heavily hit by transmission. And despite that, the children were fine. And there are certain precautions that should be taken. For example, in India, I think the bigger class sizes than in Sweden. But what happened in Sweden was that there was no masks, there was no social distancing. Uh, if, a, if a child was sick, they go home, uh, if they have a cough or running nose, but no testing. But if somebody has symptoms, they will be sent home. And I think that's a good rule. Uh, 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 so there was no sort of special uh, uh, masking or social distancing in place. And also with respect to, uh, uh, multi-generational homes. There are many more of those in India. So that is a very, that's a challenge for India in general. Uh, but it's not the children that are the problem, it's the working age adults in the household that imposes the risks to the elderly. So there was a study from Stockholm where they looked at uh, uh, the risk of people above 70. And they compared those who were above 70 who live with others in their age because who are also uh, retired versus those who live with uh, somebody like your son or daughter who is working age below 65, mm -hmm. uh, versus those who live both with a working age adult as well as children. And those who live with working age adults have higher risk than those, I think it was 60% higher risk than those who live with people their own age. Or, uh, but having also children in the household didn't increase that any further. And there's a study from Iceland where they looked at the genetics of the virus, so they can actually trace who infected who. Uh, 
and they show that while uh, parents will often infect children, the other way was very uncommon. It was not common for children to infect an adult. So unlike influenza, where the schools are actually like a hotbed of transmission for uh, the influenza, that's very different from COVID. So for COVID, schools are not. Uh, Just to be clear, because you mentioned masks, you would say that if they go back, it should be with masks on, right? Well, in Sweden, they did not have any masks on at all. The, uh, when, the, when the children in Sweden were in school, throughout the height of this pandemic, there were no mask requirements for the children. And well, despite, uh, of that, in spite of that, there were not a single death. Yeah, as you said, the number of children in the classroom between Sweden and India would be a marked difference. I wanted to ask oh. you, uh, 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 Professor Kuldorf, what do you make of the fact that 80 scientists have written in Lancet and said that there were problems with your theory that it wasn't it wasn't uh, that it, it didn't have enough scientific evidence uh, who has called it uh, ethically problematic uh, scientifically and ethically problematic what would you say to them well the who think that we are advocating herd immunity which is nonsense because uh, herd immunity is just a scientific fact like gravity so we are advocating to minimize mortality during the uh, whole length of the pandemic. And that's what the focus protection will do. Uh, in terms of the Lancet letter, there's sort of two fundamental differences in our overall take on this. And that there are two principles of public health that are very important that we have forgotten with COVID-19. One is in public health, you cannot look only at a single disease you have to look at health uh, across the board. That's one fundamental principle of, of public health. Uh, another fundamental principle is that we can't look short term, we have to look long term. So uh, one of the focuses of the Great Barrington Declaration is all the collateral damage that's caused. Uh, I mentioned the children, but also uh, 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 plummeting uh, childhood vaccination rates worse cardiovascular disease outcomes, uh, not a, uh, less cancer screening, increased mental health problems, in, including suicidal ideations. Uh, in the US, we have uh, home evictions. I know that in places like India and uh, South Africa, there are actually people who are starving to death because of the lockdown. So these are enormous uh, uh, collateral damage. And most of it is, is taking the burden of the poor uh, the other thing is we have to look at the long term. So if we want to minimize COVID deaths short term, so if we only look at COVID deaths and we want to minimize those deaths in the short term within the next few months, then lockdown is the most uh, efficient way of doing that. But that lockdown just pushes the disease into the, the future. We still, we still have to go through it because sooner or later, uh, a large proportion of us will be affected and we will reach herd immunity and then the pandemic will be over. So by pushing it in the future, mm -hmm. we are increasing the collateral damage, but we are we are not minimizing the death, only COVID death, only in the short term. So in the Lancet paper, they are sort of advocating that we should wait a few months until we have a vaccine. The problem is, even if we had a vaccine today that was safe and efficacy, which we don't have yet, but even if we had it today, it will take many months to produce enough and to vaccinate enough people until we're sort of done with that. So yes, we should do the best we can to develop the vaccine, but we can't wait another uh, many, many months to put the school kids back in schools because they are suffering and the society is suffering for that. Professor so Kulaf, you... Perspective. Yeah, uh, you know, you mentioned and others, I think Professor Sunitra Gupta had also interviewed her earlier, uh, and people who support your idea, uh, they mentioned the fact, you know, their comparison with influenza keeps coming up. But wouldn't others argue, wouldn't the other side of the argument be, well, influenza doesn't have the kind of impact uh, that we're seeing right now. For instance, we know so little about the coronavirus. Uh, we see that so many young people are dying from the disease as well. 
we see people it impacting also the nervous system so while people may not die uh, they may see long term impact like their nervous system their lungs being ravaged so they're saying the cost of this one is far far higher than the common flu so uh, the mortality of covid in young people is very very small uh, uh, and it's less than influenza Uh, I have an 18-year-old son. I'm not worried about him at all. I'm more worried about him having a traffic accident, because that's a much more dangerous thing for somebody in his age. Uh, for older people, COVID is much worse than annual influenza. So it's a big difference. So we really have to uh, 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 protect them much better than we've been doing. And in terms of uh, more long-term effects. With every infectious disease, there are some people who have long-term effects. So that's nothing that's surprising. Um, now we don't know what the long-term effects are like a year and beyond that, for obvious reasons, because nobody ever had this for more than a year. So that's a huge unknown, and I know that people are sort of uh, talking about it. But as a scientist, I can't really do that because there's no scientific evidence one way or the other. We do know that there are some people who have long-term effects, like three to six months beyond infection, and that's exactly the same as for the annual flu, for example. So also oh, another infection. So for many infectious infections, there are a few people, a minority, but a few people have long-term effects. Now I have not I have not seen any study that shows that these long-term three to six month effects are are more serious or more common after COVID nineteen. Than they are after the annual flu. So, so, so just to clarify, so so just to clarify, you're also saying that this impression is a false impression, which says that the Barrington Declaration is also about encouraging people to get herd immunity. You're not saying that. You're just saying uh, because herd immunity, building up herd immunity instead of going the vaccine route, would just mean. A large number of, even though our uh, mortality rate in India is about 1.5 percent, would mean a large number of people here in India. No, uh, if we want to minimize mortality, we should use this focus protection. That's going to minimize mortality, um, and nobody should be encouraged to get infected. That would be like saying we we encourage people to live their lives and, for example, to drive a car. But we even and we 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 let people drive the car even though we know that statistically there are going to be a few people who die in a car accident. Yeah. We don't say that if you build a, a road that that means that we're encouraging people to die in car accidents. We and it's the same thing with uh, COVID. We not encourage anybody to get the disease. We are encouraging people to live their lives because otherwise there's going to be enormous collateral damage. And yes, a few people are going to die, but if we, if it's the younger people who live their lives, they're going to be very, very few, and we will save lives. Because eventually, the immunity that's built up by the younger people will eventually also protect the older. So, final question to you: I know that this I, your your theory, the whole Barrington Declaration, has been quite welcomed by the White House. You all also visited and met White House officials last week, I believe. Tell us about that and the situation that you see there. Well, we met with the Secretary of Health in the United States, uh, Secretary um, Alex Azar, and we had a very good meeting. He had a lot. Of, he asked a lot of questions. Um, uh, so it was a very good discussion, and it was uh, myself uh, and then. Uh, Uh, Dr. Shnatra Gupta, who is, in my view, the world's preeminent infectious disease epidemiologist, and he is she is, of course, a native of your country, and also Dr. Jay Bhattacharya, uh, who is a professor uh, at Stanford, who works with uh, uh, public health policy and especially how it affects the vulnerable members of society, yes. and he's also yes. a native of your country, born in uh, West Bengal. So. Uh, Uh, it's been an enormous privilege to work with and interact with uh, these two highly esteemed uh, scientists. Uh, um, because you were at the White House, and I'm just wondering, and you know, everyone's talking about, and we are all fascinated by uh, 
your president Donald Trump's views on COVID-19. What do you what do you make of that? Because we're all you know, the entire news media is focused on how he treated his own infection. I was interested in knowing you know what your take was and the whole super spreader event and people not wearing masks. That the confirmation of uh, Amy Amy Cohn, the judge at the Supreme Court. So I wanted to know what your view was. Uh, so as a public health scientist, uh, my view is that it's my absolute duty to uh, uh, talk with and interact with any government officials who have responsibility for this pandemic. And that includes Secretary Asar, for example. So irrespectively of my political beliefs and his political beliefs, it's my duty to talk to them because we're all in this together, whether we are left or right. Uh, we all share this virus. So it would be very irresponsible for me as a public health scientist to refuse talking to government officials. I have the same view about the media. Um, I, it's, as a public health scientist, it's my responsibility to reach as many people as possible. So I talk to left media and right media. Uh, and I'm also willing to both uh, praise and criticize government officials for doing the right or wrong things. So I'm a native of Sweden. And in the spring, Sweden was heavily criticized internationally for keeping the schools open. So I defended the Swedish government for that decision and Sweden has a socialist government. Mm -hmm. So I was then defending the socialists. Uh, I have criticized the UK government for their lockdown policies, which I think are very misguided. And they have a conservative government. So I've criticized the conservative government. Uh, the governors of South Dakota and Florida, they are Republicans and they are keeping schools open and I am uh, praising them for that. While the Republican government, the, the governor of Massachusetts is also Republican, he closed them and I criticized Massachusetts for that. Mm. Scott no, Atlas, but what did you think of President Trump's handling, him taking off the mask, coming back uh, and you know meeting public, uh, appearing in public? Uh, just a couple of days into his infection. What do you think of that as a public official, a uh, public health official? As a public health official, I don't think I should comment on the actions of individual people. Okay. I think that's wrong. I need to do this as a, this is a public, uh, I view this as a public, uh, a public health matter. And I'm neither going to praise or criticize any individual uh, action, whether it's by the president or any other person. Uh, I, will, I will happily criticize the public policy, public health policy that governments are, are doing, either praising them or criticizing them, but I'm not gonna do, go into individual behavior. Professor Kuldor, thank you so much for taking time and speaking with us. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate that. Thank, uh, thank, thank you for you. your good questions and for your tough questions, because that's what <laughs> Thank, thank you. you so much. I'll be tagging you on social media with the interview. Okay, thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Take care, bye.